Wonderful to see all of you. Good morning to everybody. Thankful it hasn't quite, the bottom hasn't quite dropped out of the temperature yet, although we'll see what it does over the next few days. But thankful we have this warm place to come together, study God's Word in, in, in relative comfort. Hey, let's take our Bibles and we're going to open them this morning to Proverbs chapter 13. As we get started on the next study in this series, and I'll give you the verse or verses here in a second. Proverbs chapter 13. If you happen to just be joining us, we're several weeks now into a topical study on Proverbs, looking at many of the ways that godly wisdom and foolishness affects life. The last two Sundays, we devoted entirely to how we use our speech, our gift of language, how we communicate, the importance of that. And really, we started there because beyond probably any other topic in Proverbs, that really reveals the heart very clearly. The heart of a person is revealed often in what they say and how they say it. When it comes to wisdom and foolishness, all of us should be most concerned about the inside, right? The inside always reflects on the outside, but that's what we're really worried about. Is the heart itself right before God? If that is lined up, then every behavior and every other focus is going to fall in line as well. So we started with the mouth because the Bible has so much to say about it. And as I mentioned, we're going to kind of start working our way out from the center. And as we do this, as we prioritize those things the Bible tells us are most indicative of our spirituality or lack thereof, we come next to a subject of great importance that I want to talk to you about today. I'll introduce it with two key scriptures and then we're going to move around Proverbs a bit as we look at some different nuances of this subject. If you're just joining us, we're in Proverbs chapter 13. So if you're in Proverbs chapter 13, let's take a look down to verse 20, 13, 20. What does this text say about our personal decision-making? Solomon writes, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Again, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The study before us today will be the first in a short mini-series on different relationships. Proverbs has a tremendous amount to say about the quality and the nature of your relationships. As we walk down the path of wisdom laid out in this book, and we consider what most closely reflects the inner condition of our hearts, we need to think carefully about relationships. How you use your tongue dramatically affects relationships, but the relationships and associations themselves have such a tremendous impact on who we are and what we might become. And that truth is confirmed in numerous places in Scripture. I'll share just two more introductory passages to show you this. You don't have to turn there for the sake of time. 2 Timothy 2.22, giving counsel to Christians and especially to young men, Paul writes, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and here's the key, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. The key there is seen in the words, them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Again, the heart, right? The inner condition is what matters. There is meant to be clear guardrails, and criteria that surrounds who we draw close to as Christians. The Bible lays out, and we're going to address today, the right foundation of friendship and relationships, the right outcome of friendship or what it should produce, and the right behavior or what we must do to be good and biblical friends to other people. Did you know that being a good, godly friend doesn't happen by accident? Like every other part of the Christian life, It takes obedience to biblical principles, and it takes hard work, and it takes discipline. Why is this subject so crucial? Because those that you build relationships with, those that you associate with, have the power to deeply affect you to the point of even changing the course and the trajectory of your life. Timothy was warned to draw close to those that evidenced a pure heart, because Paul understood what other scriptures confirm, be not deceived, Evil communications corrupt good manners. It doesn't matter the intention. Your determination doesn't matter. Your attitude doesn't matter. If you choose to expose yourself to evil influences, you will be affected. Unfortunately, despite our best intentions, 
our old man, it always tends towards corruption, not towards righteousness. And this is why our inner heart condition matters so much. This is why everything that we could discuss and point out regarding this topic all comes back to many of the lessons we've already covered. Are you growing in godly wisdom? If so, then the quality and the nature of your closest relationships will reflect this. They will. On the other hand, if you are drifting into some type of foolishness or maybe have never risen above that condition, the people you associate with and the motives behind those relationships is also going to reflect that. As it turns out, just like every other area of life, this world has certain ideas about ideas and standards and guidelines about friendship and relationship that it wants you to absorb and believe. And God has certain expectations of your relationships that run totally contrary to this. God's ways are always in opposition of the world, or I should say the world's ways, always in opposition of God. As we think about how to submit to the Lord in the area of our relationships, we again must trust that he knows what he's talking about and that his ways above every other way are good and for our best. There is no need for any Christian to ever run afoul of Proverbs when it comes to our personal relationships because God has given every bit of instruction needed for our protection and for our edification. We just have to be faithful to apply it. So with that idea fixed in your mind, let's explore some key scriptures from Proverbs on the subject of friendship. First, if you will turn from 13 to chapter 19, Proverbs 19, we're going to look at the basis or the foundation for friendship and relationship as believed and practiced by the world. By the world. So the not good side of things here. Proverbs chapter 13. And if you're taking notes, our first point is this. Number one, the foundation of friendship. What is the foundation or basis of godly friendship? We're going to have a couple of sub points that fall under that main thought. If you look with me at Proverbs chapter 19 and verses 4 through 6, 4 and 6, you'll see that the world, people naturally, have an easily identifiable motive for building friendships and relationships. Hopefully you can pick it out as I read these two verses. Verse 4 says, Wealth maketh many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. You see that? Proverbs 14.20 says something very similar. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. Now we see some interesting things highlighted in these scriptures, don't we? What is the common thread that binds worldly people, the lost, together? Wealth, gift giving, power, riches. And really all those can be summarized under one notable heading. Ungodly, unspiritual, and foolish relationships are characterized by one thing, and that is, what's in it for me? What do I get out of this? What can I get out of this? What type of benefit can I squeeze out of this relationship? The Bible is true, isn't it? Just think about it. Think about what holds people together in this world. What holds entire societies and nations together? The average person likes to present themselves as cultured, discerning, and dignified. After all, We've evolved beyond the low and crude methods of the past, haven't we? But folks, you take away the benefit that a person receives in a relationship, and they're just as ready to bash somebody over the head with a rock and take what they want as they've ever been. It goes all the way back to Cain. Aside from the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that old, selfish human nature, it never really changes. And you know that's true. How many of you have ever heard someone in the world and unfortunately, maybe even in a church, say something like this. I just don't love my spouse anymore. I don't know what happened. I just don't get the same thrill I used to have being around them. Predictably, a couple of months or years later, a marriage ends. Irreconcilable differences or some other nonsense is thrown out there as an excuse. How many of you have watched as formerly close family members, co-workers, or teammates are suddenly at each other's throats. I have looked on sadly as many individuals in my line of work have gone from brothers in arms with another officer or officers to being ready to tear them to pieces in the blink of an eye. 
Why? Because the benefit or the perceived benefit was suddenly removed from the equation. And that old selfishness, that old me first at all costs attitude that was there the whole time is no longer being fed. And so it turns violently against former friends, former spouses, folks, sometimes even against other members in one of the Lord's churches. We all know of situations like this playing themselves out in a church, and it all comes back to the same thing. What is the foundation of your relationship with people? The world says, I need to do a cost-benefit analysis of this person. I need to figure out how to leverage this relationship for maximum personal benefit. I need to sign little informal prenuptial agreements with everyone so that when they stop benefiting me, I can cut and run, no questions asked. Brothers and sisters, this should go without saying, but this kind of sinful foolishness should have no place in the Lord's church and in the lives of his children. None. The foundation of your friendships and your relationships should not in any way be based on fleshly benefit or what you can get out of it. This is an ungodly reason to associate with someone. It's an ungodly reason to get married. It's an ungodly reason to become a parent, and it's an ungodly way to live your life. The lost might be ready to turn on each other at the drop of a hat. That's unsurprising, and it should be unexpected, or it should be expected. But as the scripture says, let these kinds of things not once be named among the members of the Lord's church. And so we need to think, you need to think very carefully about all the different relationships that you currently enjoy. A wife or husband, a brother or sister, a child, a grandchild, a friend, a coworker. Is there even a sliver of this kind of thinking present in your interactions with other people? Is the fact that someone gives you gifts, whether physical, emotional, or mental, the basis of your relationship with them? If it is, then you need to realize that your relationship is not a spiritual one. It's a fleshly one. And as soon as that fleshly benefit is removed, you should be ready for some major issues. By the way, this is also the reason that we as individuals in a church must be very careful, oh, so incredibly careful, about how we seek to attract folks and how we build relationships for the purpose of evangelism and for preaching the gospel. We are not to be in the business of catering to a lost person's desire for fleshly benefits or playing right into what I just talked about. That's not our work. We can go down the road of feed, feeding people's flesh when we should be ministering to their spirits. When a person enters this building that is lost, they should not remember God's people because they were given something that satisfied their flesh or that their belly was filled but that they stood in the midst of a group of people that truly know and truly worship the living God. That's what they should remember. That because of our devotion and our brokenness over what Christ has done for us, that they would see their own brokenness and their desperate need as well. That they would leave this place learning not what's in Christianity for them, but what their solemn responsibility is before Almighty God. Whatever you use to attract someone is what you will have to use to keep them. And no part of any of our relationships should be built on this sandy foundation. So think about it. Consider carefully your relationships this morning and be absolutely sure to root out all and exterminate all selfishness and worldly thinking. And in place of that, let's look at what God says about the right reason to enter into a relationship. And we've already touched on this by reading that passage in 2 Timothy. And Proverbs 22, 11 adds to this by saying, He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, the king shall be his friend. What do you see emphasized in both the Old Testament and the New? Is your personal growth and wisdom important? Is walking in the Spirit a priority for you? The Bible teaches that the only godly foundation for friendship and the basis of any righteous relationship you could have, it really comes back to a mutual commitment to the Lord. All your friendships, all of them, are meant to be solidly founded or built 
on the purity of a life that is yielded to Christ in salvation and that continues to be yielded to him on a daily basis. You see, just like wisdom itself, friendship is not about you. Instead, it's about two individuals with pure hearts, both pointed towards the Lord. The question, what's in it for me, totally obliterated by what can we do for him together? Only God could craft a situation where we have the privilege of asking that question. And as we do, other precious saints step up alongside us to ask the same question. From an individual believer all the way to an entire church, what can we do for him together that we couldn't do separately? That's the foundation. Folks, considering that wisdom itself, the knowledge of God and submission to him is the only ground to build a relationship on, shouldn't we be prioritizing this? It's sometimes easy to view our walk with the Lord maybe a bit abstractly. We're greatly limited in what we can perceive. This is one chief reason why he gives us godly relationships. Did you ever think about the fact that the quality of your relationships with other believers is directly reflective of your relationship with God? The closer you are to the Lord, the closer you will be to his people. It's just another indicator for us in our often fleshly and human state. If you consider yourself to be a spiritual man or a woman, and yet there is a constant or even frequent animosity and tension between you and other believers, you need to reconsider the condition of your own heart. Are you really, is it really as pure as you believe? The only possible thing that could come between two Christians is the flesh. That's it. There is no other hindrance between God and man or between two of his children. So we can see first in Proverbs that the world unsurprisingly, has the idea of friendship and relationship totally wrong, totally backwards. Fleshly relationships are unstable, they're self-gratifying, and they are short-lived at best. None of them are eternal. A Christian should never be wondering what they can get out of a marriage, a friendship, a child, or another church member. That kind of attitude only spells disaster. Instead, we must ensure that we we are walking in close fellowship with God, that we're developing in wisdom, and that we are among those that are calling out to the Lord from a pure heart. Be the kind of friend that other believers need, Christ himself being the foundation for your friendships. Now, as we continue, obviously there are some specific things that God intends to come about as a result of your friendships and your relationships. I'll be honest, as I think about those friendships and relationships that have affected me the most, words, they really fail in most cases to describe the depth of what God gives to me through them. That, for me, highlights one of the biggest differences between worldly relationships and godly ones. Instead of a selfish grasping after what people can give you, spiritual relationships, they're full of constant wonder and joy over things received that none of us deserve. The blessing of getting to do the Lord's work is astonishing enough, but the fact that we get to do so with brothers and sisters, well, it's about as close to heaven as you can get on earth, isn't it? Let's look at some of the things that God has built into and that will characterize all spiritual relationships. Again, it's a litmus test of sorts to help us gauge the quality of our own friendships. So the second point is this, number two, the benefits of friendship. The benefits of friendship. I realize that I just got done speaking at length about the fact that we should not seek relationships for what we can get out of them, but that does not mean that the outcome of a spiritual relationship is missing some significant spiritual benefits. And that's literally the key. Does the relationship produce these kinds of fruit? There are many that we could mention, I'm sure you can think over the numerous blessings that we have enjoyed throughout the years because of our relationships and friendships with God's people. I'll highlight just three of them for you because Proverbs speaks directly to them. And these will characterize all relationships that are built on the right thing. The first is found in Proverbs 27.9. Proverbs 27.9, which tells us, Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. 
Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend, by hearty counsel. As an observation and principle, spiritual relationships are a source and are to be the source of the best and most helpful counsel a person could receive. I love this verse. I've experienced this verse. The comparison is made between wonderful, costly items like a healing salve or a perfume. Hearty counsel is a sweet and it is a blessed thing. There is nothing quite like the dependable, humble counsel of a friend that walks with God. Having a friend like this gives great joy and rejoicing with the added benefit of helping keep you on the right path. How many of you have received hearty counsel? It's meaty, right? There's substance there. There's something to sink your teeth into. It's a wonderful thing. This kind of interaction is saturated with the words of God. In contrast to the empty and foolish speculations of worldly people, believers have real, tangible help in the scriptures, and they are, through counsel, able to pass this help on to others. That's part of what makes the counsel of a godly friend so welcomed. They give you something to sink your teeth into. They give you something you can really take action on. By the way, all of these benefits... And they should be viewed as personal challenges to you in your relationships. We'll speak more about how to be the kind of friend that God desires. But even now you should see that Proverbs 27.9, it requires both a listener and a speaker. Someone receiving the counsel, somebody giving it. And we need to excel at both of those positions. Able to both give and receive sound counsel and instruction. If you haven't developed in either of these areas, really, all I can say is get after it. There is likely someone in your life right now that could benefit from it. So the first outcome we find from a spiritual relationship is they are the source of the best and most helpful counsel. Next, Proverbs 27, 17 tells us that a good friend will be faithful to sharpen your character. That's a very familiar verse, isn't it? Iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Now I recognize that this verse frequently appears on everything from tactical patches to exercise equipment. In contrast to the world's idiotic misrepresentation of what this is talking about, Solomon is identifying the godly friend and one that takes action to help a brother or sister be godlier. We're still talking about the giving and receiving of counsel here, except this verse It draws out an element of confrontation that must be present in every good relationship. When a knife is sharpened, it by necessity loses some of its original self, doesn't it? Tiny flakes of metal are removed as an edge is honed and polished. And that might seem detrimental at first, but without refinement, a blade is useless, isn't it? Do your friends and do you have a vision of godliness that changes and challenges others? And you, do you resolve to act as a whetstone in the presence of your friends, seeking to leave them better and sharper than when you found them? I know I've used many different types of knife sharpeners over the years. By the way, a good knife sharpener doesn't help if you're just terrible at sharpening knives. Some of those sharpeners have made a lot of heat and activity with little measurable result. Others produced a razor-sharp blade with much less effort. It's interesting that in the metaphor, the end result of that knife depends on both the quality of the blade and the quality of the sharpener. You might be a good quality steel, and your friends might be quality iron, but if you don't get down to the business of sharpening, all of you are going to remain dull. Also, let's not forget that getting little pieces of yourself chipped off is often painful or at the very least uncomfortable. This tells us that any friendship and a godly friendship must include some level of the right type of pain. It's a good pain. It's like exercise because it means that two people are becoming more like Christ. That dullness and rough, unrefined edges are being worn down. Something's actually being made useful. Don't discount this benefit of godly friendship It's one of the Lord's main intents of putting you in the silverware drawer with the rest of us. The third result in pursuing the right kind of friendship, in addition to receiving counsel and being sharpened, is given to us in Proverbs 17, 17. 
And here we find a very serious need that all of us have, even if it's hard to admit sometimes. Proverbs 17, 17, Scripture says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Protection. Protection, support, and strength in time of need. Do you remember what we read in Ecclesiastes 4? Verse 9 and 10 say, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. You know, many world relationships or ungodly relationships, they're characterized by indifference and self-sufficiency. We might get along with each other, but we don't really depend on one another. That is not how Christians are supposed to operate. Even if we like to pretend we are islands unto ourselves, that we are strong and capable and untouchable, deep down we all know that's wrong. We constantly need each other, and sometimes God sends certain things into our lives to remind us just how much we need to lean on other believers. Proverbs 17, 17 makes it clear that a godly friendship will produce love all the time, no matter the circumstances, no matter the challenges. This love means that a brother... A true brother or sister will stick with you through adversity and difficulty. Remember how we talked about the basis for worldly friendship? Well, I can guarantee you that once the benefits of your company are gone, you're going to find out who your true friends and your true comforters are. I think of Job enduring the various theories and accusations of the three men that visited him. He laments, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Shall vain words have an end, or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as ye do, if your soul were in my soul's stead. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. God help us to be better friends than Job's companions. If we're not walking in wisdom and seeking to strengthen and edify our brethren, then certainly the title of miserable comforter could be laid at our feet as well. If you're fostering the kinds of relationships that the Bible describes, then you will find them to be the source of some of the greatest encouragement and strength that you'll find on this earth. As our relationships with others are a reflection of our relationship with God, so is the help and strength offered to us through them a reflection of God's love and his care for us. The godly and wise friend acts as a representative of God in his interactions with others. He offers good, sound counsel. He sharpens. And now, as Proverbs 17 says, he gives his friend strength in adversity. Before we continue, I want to ask, do these kinds of things, do these qualities represent the nature of the relationships that you have with God's people? No doubt all of us will endure various worldly relationships with folks in our workplace, maybe in our family, in other contexts. But the shallow and unspiritual nature of these, it must not bleed into what happens or goes on in the Lord's house and in his work. Is your foundation right? Are you faithful to call on the Lord out of a pure heart? And then what is the fruit of your friendships? Like every other area we talked about, you can measure the quality of your interactions and your attitude against the example right here in God's word. You can know where you are in every context, and you can make the changes that need to be made to make sure that all your friends or friendships are right, and they're appropriate, and they're doing what God intends. Now, as we begin to wind this message down, I want to leave you with the final point for consideration, as well as some very practical things that you can start putting into action this morning, today, and this week. Praise God, he always gives us a foundation, a blessing, and a direction to go. What should we be doing to be people that practice the right kind of godly friendship? So foundation, outcome, benefits, and now number three, the behavior of friendship. What actions will affect my ability to be a true friend and also receive from others what God intends? The first is identified in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24. Proverbs 18, verse 24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. 
A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. This verse, it both exemplifies the superiority of spiritual relationships and it gives a cautious warning to all of God's people. In the first place, we should expect to be the closest, not necessarily to our physical families, but to those that walk alongside us in the Lord's service. Jesus specifically highlighted this difference when he asked, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. You must not devalue godly relationships, folks. The Lord has established them as the closest relationships a believer can have on this earth. The physical connection made in a human family pales in comparison to the spiritual connection people have when they're united around and in salvation. So please, value the spiritual connections that God has given you very highly. Don't take them for granted. They are gifts from a good God that wants us to draw close to one another. Next, in this verse, we can see that the responsibility to be a godly friend, it can't be slewed or tossed off on other people, can it? It actually lies with each one of us. If you will have the kinds of friendships that God intends, if you're going to enjoy counsel and sharpening and strengthening, then you must show yourself to be friendly. This is a seemingly obvious thing, and yet a lot of us miss the full import of what is said. We miss it because we so easily gravitate towards that old selfish way of thinking that says, I'll wait around for someone to be friendly towards me. Really, it's just another form of the early question we raised, what's in it for me, right? This verse is speaking about being proactive, isn't it? You don't just wait around for someone to cater to your interests and then decide to be friends. That's what the world tells you friendship is, though. And this model has spelled disaster for so many relationships. If you recognize that you need good godly friends, and we all do, bar none, then get off your rear end, make sure your heart is right before God, and pursue those kinds of relationships with other people. Like we discussed a few weeks ago, you can use your tongue to encourage, to enlighten, and to enable. And all along the way, you'll be building the right kinds of relationships on the right foundation of mutual service to God. Note also that being friendly doesn't mean that we inundate other believers with fleshly interests and distractions. You don't need to be the life of the party or the social butterfly to have wonderful relationships. You certainly don't need to spend a bunch of money and try to pump up your image before other people. Remember, Proverbs confirmed that all those types of things, they're worldly tactics, and they attract worldly people. They also weaken godly relationships rather than strengthening them. So be friendly in the right way, in a spiritual way, and be proactive. Next, we find that we all have a responsibility to be intensely loyal to God's people, loyal in our friendships and relationships. Proverbs 27.10 states, Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Boy, isn't that true? When we need a person's confidence and when we need help, their closest to us is worth so much. They are in our corner and they can actually help us. We must be loyal to our friends because we are loyal to the foundation for them. We don't excuse sin or wrongdoing, and I'm certainly not talking about some type of a blind or unquestioning loyalty, but I am talking about the evil and the worldly tendency to cut a person out of your life and run away at the slightest provocation. Have you ever heard of something called ghosting? It's a thing. This is when a person just stops communicating with somebody else without any warning or explanation. And it's really the kind of selfishness we're talking about taken to its greatest extent. I have so little loyalty and respect for others that I think it's appropriate to just end a relationship with them with no explanation at all. This kind of action destroys any confidence in a person as a friend. People need your loyalty. They need your consistency. They need your support. There should be no stronger bonds and no deeper loyalty than what's shared among Christians. So be loyal. 
Next, we find a parallel verse to iron sharpeneth iron in Proverbs 27, 6. It says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you're going to be the kind of friend that God intends you to be, you must be friendly. You must be loyal. Folks, you must be willing to rebuke and correct when it's needed. In other words, you can't be a coward when it comes to relationships. Every godly friendship will require some level of rebuke and exhortation and correction. Those little pieces of steel don't just fall away on their own. The text states that the wounds of a friend are faithful, meaning that if you are faithful, you will be wounding your friends, obviously in the right way. We need constant tuning and reminder and help in this area. It doesn't always feel good. Actually, it, it never feels good, but it's desperately needed. When we discussed godly speech, I mentioned the fact that how we interact with others can pave the way for God's conviction to make some significant and some long-lasting changes. Being a faithful friend works the same way. We're not looking to injure someone for the sake of injury. This is a loving effort, not a malicious one. You're seeking to be the kind of friend that provokes another to sanctification, not the kind that makes excuses for unspiritual or fleshly behavior. Sometimes this requires direct, strong engagement with known sin or sins. Other times, and I would say most of the time, this work is accomplished in a gentle and a consistent fashion as you consider the Bible with another person. We may act as representatives of God in many respects, but ultimately he's the one that needs to be wounding people so he can also heal them. Be honest with your friends. Be brave to confront issues and deal with them appropriately. Don't sweep a chance at greater sanctification under the rug for the sake of some type of false peace. And make absolutely sure, and I really can't emphasize this enough, that you restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. The attitude that you bring to the table and the manner that you display it in is just as important as the content that you deliver. Don't forget that you will need similar input from your friends very soon. If you haven't sinned yet, it's just not your turn. Wait a couple days. The last behavior of friendship that I want to cover today rounds out the other points we've looked at. It's not an all-inclusive list, obviously, but it's certainly a helpful one. Proverbs 17.9 tells us, He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a manner separateth very friends. He that covereth a transgression seeketh love. Friendly, loyal, honest, and finally, gracious. Be a gracious friend. Give other people the same grace and the same mercy that you've experienced in your life. This verse, it gives such a, a powerful contrast. The binding power of godly love versus the polarizing nature of the flesh. The brother that covers the transgression of another, it says, seeks or pursues, chases after love. The brother that seeks the destruction or disunity of others does not. Now, it should be noted, this is not talking about excusing sin in an inappropriate manner. This is talking about not being an unnecessarily critical and nitpicky type of person. A fault finder, a complainer, a scornful man. These kinds of people always set themselves up as the authority, and then they go scorched earth on everybody else, because at bottom they're ruled by pride. In contrast, love, and a true friend, though he may have to wound you very significantly, is willing to forbear, to think the best of you, to support you and guide you and protect you and your heart. He doesn't put your failures on blast for everyone to see. Instead, there is discretion and there is care taken in every situation. This especially rings true in how we respond to times when our friends hurt or fail us or offend us. Do we take the opportunity to cut them down to size, or are we patient, bearing with them as Christ has borne with us? 
This is one of those areas in our relationship where a person's heart really lies just beneath the surface. How you respond when offended by another, how do you respond when offended by another or when confronted by something you don't like? Is your love sufficient to cover such a wrong? If it is indeed godly love, then it will be. If not, get ready for the feeding frenzy. So what can you take from this and what can you apply today? Well, are you friendly? Are you showing yourself friendly? Are you loyal? Do you stick with others through thick and thin? Are you honest and willing to exhort and rebuke when it's needed? Are you courageous about your friend's spiritual welfare? And finally, are you willing to forgive and exercise compassion as we all and fail and do fail on a daily basis? The quality of those that you keep company with and how you interact with them, second to how you speak, has such a huge part to do with whether you're truly growing in wisdom, whether you're truly maturing as you ought to be. As we close, please think back on the foundation for your friendships. Make sure they're not built on selfishness. If they're founded on the right things, then the fruit and the result's going to be right as well. May the Lord help all of us to seek the right kinds of friendships and in finding them to be good and godly friends. I'm thankful for godly friendships. I'm thankful for each of you and your work in this area. Psalm 133.1 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's what we should chase. That's what we should pursue. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth found here in Proverbs and the way it shapes every, every part of our life, if we'll allow it to. Thank you that you are the foundation for every good and godly friendship we could have as we mutually serve you together. I pray that as we do that, Lord, that we'd be careful to analyze our, our relationships and the motives behind them and that we'd be very guarded as we uh, make sure that we're being godly friends in the, in the areas we've discussed today. I pray that as we do this, um, the relations here, relationships here would continue to grow stronger and as a result, the entire church body would grow stronger as well. Thank you for your friendship towards us and for giving us friends. In Jesus' name, amen.